Greetings to everyone present. Uh, my name is Ankit Malhotra. I'm the co-founder and president of the Jindal Society of International Law, which is a student-led initiative under the aegis of the Center for the Study of United Nations and works under the expert guidance and tutelage of Professor Dr. Weston Popowski. Um, this society was founded in 2020 in the midst of the pandemic, but it's grown strength from strength since then. We were officially launched on the 18th day of November 2020 by the Herbert and Rose Rubin Professor of International Law, Professor Jose Enrique Alvarez of New York University, along with our university's respected Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. C. Rajkumar, the Faculty Coordinator and Executive Director of the Center and the Society, Professor Dr. Weston Popowski, and a very dear friend of the Center and Society, Professor Dr. Mohan Kumar. The purpose of this society is to increase the student interaction with the subject matter of international law through its various initiatives. Rather than being primarily research driven, we intend to offer a host of experiences that contribute towards skill building, thereby increasing the knowledge database available to students and members of the society. The society is an attempt to bridge the lacuna by streamlining resources and inculcating an overall interest in the vast expanses of international law. We aim to provide a space to young international law enthusiasts to nurture their interests in this field of law and study. As a society, we will be failing in our objectives if we don't speak about perhaps the most important part of such an initiative, which speaks directly to career opportunities and career councils. And to speak about this, we have, we have students and, and young professionals who are involved in doing exactly that. Um, and now invite the moderator for this session to kick off the proceedings and um, uh, moderate this session further. Yulia, the floor is yours now, please. Thank you so much, Ankit, and thank you for everyone uh, for joining this event. The idea of this event was to basically uh, provide a platform for you to ask questions and also to show that behind every successful person, there is a bunch of uh, challenges, hard work, sometimes failures. And I hope that our participants will genuinely and kindly share their experiences, how they got where they are now. And in the end of the session, you will have uh, the chance to ask them questions. So I will just start from introducing our panelists and then we will move to some questions and then we will leave the rest of the time for Q&A. So our first speaker is uh, Mohit Kupchandani. Mohit uh, was working for more than seven years already as, a, as an international dispute resolution attorney. And he has a stellar CV. He has worked in many, uh, many countries, many cities. And uh, most of his work was based at the UN, at different agencies of the UN, including the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Uh, he was also a clerk at the International Court of Justice. Uh, Mohit was uh, working for the International Law Commission. Uh, also, he has worked for many international law firms. And uh, he has also some domestic experience in India, working for the Foreign Ministry and uh, the Office of the Attorney General of India. Um, so in his current position, he is uh, assisting the UN uh, International Law Commission, and he will be soon relocating to Paris to start his work at the Gilad uh, Banifatemi Shebaya disputes. Um, and then next we have uh, Shubhangi Agarwala, who has not less uh, uh, impressive uh, background. Currently, uh, Shubhangi is uh, assistant to the chair of the International Law Commission uh, to Professor Dirat Ladi. And in her previous capacities, uh, Shubhangi also advised India before uh, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, and also she worked uh, in law firms that represented India before, uh, before the World Trade Organization. Next, we have Ankit uh, Malhotra, who is our host of this event. He 
uh, graduated Jindal Law School. And uh, during his time at the, at the school, he won different awards, including the best uh, student researcher uh, award. And most importantly, he also co-founded this uh, amazing society, the Jindai Society of International Law. And uh, he's also a recipient of the scholarship from the International Law Association uh, to attend the biennial uh, conference. And maybe he will tell us about it uh, during his uh, interventions. And last but not least, we have uh, Anusha Mathu Sudhan who is an international uh, lawyer with degrees from National University of Advanced Legal Studies in India and uh, New York University. Uh, and Anusha is specializing in international uh, dispute resolution. And in her professional capacities, uh, she was at Widen Case um, in the Middle East and also consulted multiple NGOs and think tanks around the globe. Um, and besides her practical uh, work, so to say, Anusha also teaches law at the National, at the National Law School uh, of India University. And just a few words about myself. My name is Julia Emtseva. Uh, I'm a research fellow slash PhD candidate at the Max Planck uh, Institute for International Law in Heidelberg. I am um, qualified as a lawyer in Kyrgyzstan, where I also did my first law degree. Um, yeah, and now finding myself in, in this position. So I would be happy to answer questions if you might, you have some questions uh, at the end. But now let's start. So um, I would ask uh, our participants to maybe uh, start their interventions with telling us how uh, you got there where you are now uh, in your positions and maybe with a spe special focus on failures, like what were the challenges that you faced throughout this um, throughout this path? Uh, and I guess maybe we can start from Mohit. Mohit, do you want to take the floor? Thank you very much, and uh, for the very generous introduction. And most of it, I don't think I deserve the cause. I will now speak of my failure, which will tell you why I don't deserve most of it. And I think that even if you didn't ask me to, my narrative would have automatically focused on failure, things that we can obviously not see on our resumes and certainly not on our LinkedIn profiles. So I will actually begin by saying that there's one celebrity, uh, uh, a sports person from India. Uh, he's a cricketer. His name is Rahul Dravid. Um, and he's the person who I follow and take inspiration from every moment of my life. Yes, it's not a person from the legal field. But what I would say is that throughout his playing days as a professional cricketer, he performed the best when the team was pushed against the wall. And he was then aptly named as the great wall of cricket and as a human his his virtues particularly are humility and tenacity and once he was uh, giving an interview when he was questioned about uh, success and failure and this is the only part i promise that is not organic so i will quote what he said so he said and i quote he said across formats I batted 604 times for India. I didn't cross uh, the 50 runs score 410 times out of those innings. I failed a lot more times than I succeeded. I'm more of a failure than a success, so I'm quite qualified to talk about failure, unquote. What I'm trying to imply here is perhaps obvious. What I'm trying to say here is that I have lost count on the number of applications that I've made to several places and how many times I have been rejected. I can say this, confess this uh, unbashedly, and I can say that my success rate is, is in fact much lower than what I quoted to you, perhaps 5%. So 95% of the times when I'm sending applications to places, I'm rejected. 
or my application is not even acknowledged. Uh, so now what helps me is the two virtues that I'm learning from my role model, uh, tenacity, uh, being patient, not losing humility in any situation whatsoever. And this uh, helps me in, in going further. And, and just to say one last aspect, I think that what is a failure and what is a success is something that can have different prisms. Uh, I am, as I speak to you now, I, I have come back to New Delhi after uh, attending a position at the age of 30 after having seven years of work experience, as you said, and that position was unpaid because I was transitioning between two jobs and, uh, and I did not know when my second job would start because visas are uh, a huge issue, especially for people coming from the global south. So I worked in an unpaid position in the meantime. What I have gathered from that position is something that only I know uh, how much it means to me and no one can take that away from me. But yes, it was unpaid. So I've saved for my rainy days. I continue doing so. Uh, public international law is, is not a ladder that we can climb through as a success ladder. It's not a linear path for me. But the silver lining is, and I will end here, that it is somewhat a ladder that is tilted at 15 degrees. It's, it's not 90. So we may feel that we're failing, we're not progressing so much. But at least what I've seen is that after each step that I take in this field, I, I have progressed a bit. So, and sometimes it is so minuscule that only I can understand, perhaps gaining some soft skills, which don't appear anywhere else. So I don't then see uh, such instances as failures for myself and and that's what keeps me going and i will get to the remaining part successes later because that's easier to speak about thank you, thank you so much mohit i think you progressed enormously so uh you don't have to uh, speak badly about your uh, your achievements but it takes a courage right to to accept and to uh, not only to accept, but to publicly claim that most of the things that, you, that you've done before were unsuccessful. Uh, so maybe we can uh, continue the discussion and uh, I'll pass the floor to Shupangi. Sure. So I think I completely agree with Mohit. I think uh, like choosing a career in international law is uh, a very interesting choice, I think, especially when you're coming from the global south. Uh, I think I'm uniquely positioned even in this chat because I'm someone who does not have an LLM yet. Um, so this also means that the only degree on, uh, okay, of course, and Ankit is there, but uh, this also means that the only like like university on our uh, resumes are universities that like most employees won't recognize, uh, irrespective of whether like these are universities that are doing, like that are considered to be reputed in our own uh, countries. So I think, um, that was one aspect of it. But then I think something that I really struggled with, at least in the beginning of um, like deciding whether I want to even pursue a career in international law was whether it bore any relevance um, for me and for people like me. So, you know, like the, just like the most primal question of whether international law even matters. Uh, because I think like for most people, you want to do something where you feel like your work has relevance and it matters. Um, and I think, it's really hard if you if you are studying in um, a university in India where I think apart from like one or two universities, most international law faculties are not fully well equipped um, to teach international law in as comprehensively as students uh, in India would like um, to understand what relevance it plays because it just seems like such a pipe dream to like an average law student from India. Um, so I think it was really, that was like a whole different conversation to understand why it matters in the first place. And I think 
what really helped me very paradoxically was I did a research stint at the Max Planck, uh, like an internship stint at the Max Planck Institute um, with Kanad. Uh, Pakshi, I'm sure Ulya, you recognize him. And um, this is interesting because even though Max Planck is not entirely recognized for like trail approaches to international law, uh, it was at Max Planck away from like Delhi, away from India, where I was introduced to like critical approaches to international law. So it's, I think it's really paradoxical that like, you have to go to Europe to learn about critique. Um, and I think that was interesting, but it also um, like helped me at least contextualize where international law fit in, uh, even in my own research interests and whether it bore any relevance to like say the domestic and everyday life of the people I saw around me. So that was one thing that was like the more, uh, I don't know, like theoretical challenge of whether I want to do international in the first place or not. Uh, but apart from that, I think, of course, I think there are just so many um, challenges that you face as a woman, as a woman from the global south, uh, not with like a super recognized university degree, uh, where you have to constantly prove yourself and try to make people understand that you're, you're, you don't only you're not only here to learn international law but you also have you might have something meaningful to contribute even if it might not fit the exact parameters of what say doctrinal international legal scholarship might look like um that being said i think largely what i've found is that most people in the field at least um the ones that i have encountered are enormously helpful so i think it's really heartening to see that even if you cold email, say a bunch of people, and even if say like 15, you cold email 15 people and 10 people don't respond to you, you'll have five people who do respond to you, who'll be open to have a chat with you and who actually like sit you down and talk to you, uh, talk to you about their journeys and like try to help you in very concrete ways, instead of just talking about um, where they struggled or like what you can learn from them. They'll actually try, try to take out some time to uh, either like, and like guide you towards paid opportunities or um, link you up with people who might be able to um, get you those opportunities. And I think the final aspect of what made international super challenging was again, like what Mohit highlighted that most opportunities are very short-lived and also unpaid. And I think that is very, very challenging because um, particularly when you have like your own familial obligations and you have to like, confront yourself and understand why you want to um, work on, on a field where people are constantly critique, like constantly questioning whether it's international, whether it's law, and here you are working like in not, like some crazy hours, uh, very little pay. I think that is another aspect that is um, very, I don't know, it just makes you wonder. And I think that's also a reason why I find myself um, like shifting towards law firms at the moment, which is not a, a career path I would have foreseen, because I think most people who are interested in international law uh, come to the field with certain aspirations. But I think just the nature of the field is such that you tend to like shift towards um, anything that has more job security. Thank you so Thanks. much, Shupangi. And uh, I'm sure Kanad is very, very proud of you. <laughs> uh, I can guarantee that. And uh, what you said about mentorship, it's really important. But I guess we should touch upon this point uh, even further, maybe when we will discuss success or learnings, what, what actually help us to, um, uh, to get our jobs or our positions where we are. But it's also interesting that you mentioned that it's not only where you come from, it's not only the global south, but it's the intersectionality of all these challenges. It's the gender, it's race, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And what I'm tired of hearing is that women have to work harder. No, we don't have to work harder. No, it's, it shouldn't be the case. It, we should work as, uh, as everybody works. So again just wanted to highlight this point maybe it's uh, <laughs> maybe it's irrelevant in our uh, discussion but I promise myself that I will uh, challenge this when I hear it all the time because if we want to make a change we have to change this first and on this <laughs> on this note maybe we can um, move to Ankit. Ankit do you have something to share with us? Well, Gandhi once very famously said, be the change you want to see. 
and i think at least for at least for ladies at least for women in this field um you have so many people to look up to you have now judges also in the icj who speak directly about this and in some sense got recognition in the field of international law through 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 their work on feminism and international law um well let me also thank everyone here for agreeing to do this and uh, for yulia to step in and do this as a moderator who's perhaps who's perhaps done a mini llm on this given the uh, symposium that she chaired on this on the on the blogs which generates a lot of interest and also basic information for students who are developing an interest in this field um on on opportunities i remember mohit once said a similar event when he said that a lot of opportunities don't even exist but that doesn't mean that you can't create them and i think i think you need to hustle you need to get down in and as shubhangi said write write to as many people as you can i mean writing emails is not taxed at least as of now so write as much as you can and this society started out like that i mean we've hosted speakers because we wrote emails to them and they responded favorably now of course the idea for this was ingrained in my mind when i met professor chimney who just joined my university as a uh, as a associate as a as a sort of celebrated professor um he wanted to start an initiative which couldn't take off because of the pandemic but what really but this idea is really essentially his when he start when he started this this started compelling me to imagine something with international law which is based on students. he asked me to become a student interlocutor in his initiative which was essentially for professors but but the idea was there and the idea was born then and i think the pandemic really helped uh, the society grow in terms of connecting schol scholars from all across the globe and that was essentially the focus as well the society at least in students is 600 members we've got around 40 advisors and the, all of this happened in the pandemic and now we're working on a book which comes out next year which is a co-edited book which focuses on all of these aspects which the society has been able to cover but um personally speaking there have been also so many failures as well um with respect to rejections for papers at conferences uh uh, internships at at the offices in the hague or geneva but um i've always recollected what professor koskiniemi said at his address at the hague academy when he spoke about national law and the right uh, populism uh, of course he's also associated with the society and and then uh, we hosted his book launch just a fortnight ago and he said something quite interesting then and also to me personally is that it's very easy to work in an institution like this of course he says that with a perspective of a lot of privilege but what he said is quite interesting he said that it's very difficult to work with an organization and to build it from the outside but that's that's essentially how an institution is built and how it moves forward because once you enter into the institution it becomes very difficult to change it you essentially get molded into the atmosphere in which it works now uh, mohit also mentioned uh, persons who inspire him or a person who inspires him well i have mine too uh, these are all pale male and stale but they still de are deeply inspiring to me the first one being servants in churchill and churchill is a different character and i started out reading about him because he is a different character it was essentially to unearth what churchill actually said did and was and that is something which which started me to read about him in a light of international law as well and then i presented this as a paper to the international church of society on invite from the churchill family his great grandson wrote back to me and said that we want you to present this paper on human rights and churchill he's always been associated with famines genocides and the ilk but to study him and how he inspired the european convention on human rights is something which i'm rather proud of because that required a lot of reading but it also required a lot of determination to see someone in a different light and not conduct an anachronistic study of history so it's essentially been trying to develop 
opportunities for yourself and try and see the things in a different light and to take it with take everything with a bit of pinch of salt and uh, of course the other inspire other persons who inspire me are a chef and a and a, and a philosopher uh, philosopher sir roger scruton is a conservative uh, god bless his soul we lost him last year and the third one is a is a chef from yorkshire whose name is marco pierre white who whose restaurant I went to when I was doing the global governance course in Oxford, uh, which is where I was introduced to Professor Dapo Kande, uh, Antonio Zanakopoulos in 2017. And I've been associated with them ever since. But what I'm essentially trying to suggest is that in, in at least my growth, it's not just been my growth, it's been growth of an entire legion and pantheon of persons who've supported me through this journey. And failure has all, never been looked at as failure, it's actually been looked at as an opportunity to learn from something. And to, as Shivangi said, focus not on these institutions, but actually law firms and Queen's councils, because the real, the real legal movement actually takes place outside of these institutions. Great, thank you so much, Ankit. Anusha, let's uh, finally hear from you. Thank you. And when I was hearing all of all of the panelists speaking, I couldn't help but think that you know um, everybody, especially like you, Ankit, having sort of you're still like you know in university and having graduated, you've already sort of learned so much about the field and the like how to sort of identify opportunities and all of that and I remember myself in undergrad in 2016 with nothing but dreams to my name and I didn't know half as much as you know the the young people today know like they they speak a lot they write to people a lot and I think this culture of kind of um, informational calls and mentoring has really picked up over the last few years and it's just so heartening to see that not only are people interested in the field but they there honestly is this culture of sort of uh, teaching people more about the field that they're interested in helping them out so yeah I'm really uh, happy to be a part of this panel and I'm really also grateful uh, to be going at the end because I've now distilled a lot of the information that the other speakers have kind of mentioned and I want to highlight a few things that are personal to my experience but then also maybe that resonate with me from what the others have spoken about. So definitely one thing that Mohit said that for me resonated and which I tell people all the time is that if you really are committed to a um, to public international law as a career you do have to understand that success is not always linear because there's no one way to be an international lawyer. So the number one question that I think you have to ask yourself, and it, this can change as it has changed for me over time, my definition of what kind of a professional I want to be has changed. So once you know what kind of work you want to do, uh, then the next step is to really kind of reach out to people who are doing the kind of work that you're doing, and then maybe ask them for advice on what your next one, two or three steps can be. So um, I think if I have to identify a failure, I would also say something similar that perhaps the other panelists would have also experienced, which is not knowing how many applications I sent out really. But if I'm just looking at UN applications, there was a point in my career where I thought I really wanted to work with the UN and that is the final goal. And having, and I did work with the UN and I did work with, you know, affiliated organizations. I met a lot of people from the UN and I realized that that's not exactly what I wanted to be doing, but I'll get into that a little bit later. I think I, so when I checked my, um, I went through the number of applications I sent before this discussion and I sent out roughly 65 job applications to various UN agencies. And I actually heard back from two one of which I actually accepted. So I'm told that this is actually a relatively high success rate, uh, but I thought it was completely, um, it was, I thought I really wasn't good enough at all because I don't think I've ever applied to 65 jobs in a single like kind of institution and either not heard back or like gotten rejected. But um, so so what, I've, what I was told in New York is that uh, you need to apply to at least 100 jobs. Like that's the average kind of number that people have in mind. Anything less than that, people say 
it's fine like you know it's very predictable that you won't get accepted um, that early on and the other mistake that i made is having a timeline if you want to work with the un i think that you should be open to not knowing when that can happen in my mind i thought oh okay i'm going to apply in january i would like to be working with the un entity by august it doesn't work like that because every department's funding changes their requirements change they keep readvertising the job the whole the selection process may take 12 months depending on you know the the type of um, the type of job that you're applying for so definitely like i would encourage people to be pursuing other more realistic or more time bound sort of jobs while they like while they remain true to their passion to work with the un so don't only be applying for un jobs that's one mistake that i made uh just do that along with your other like you know the rest of your um, uh, job hunt um the other thing that i wanted to mention is yeah so if you are going to be in the field of public international law i think one skill that i feel really helped me is developing the ability to be okay with not knowing what's next so when i look back at my career path after i graduated from nyu i was i worked as an intern with the indian mission to the un and after that i actually got a job there and that's quite rare but uh, it was a lot of time and place kind of situation and i ended up working there full time and then i actually was hired by another foreign mission to be their international legal advisor which is also very rare that it's uh, i don't know a lot of people uh, who would have encouraged me if i said i want to be a legal advisor for a foreign government in new york i think it's a very remote possibility but it it is possible so i wouldn't say it's impossible but it's tough and i think that i had the support of my mentors and professors especially in nyu i so singularly credit nyu for my entire sort of career trajectory because from one person at nyu i ended up meeting eight or nine different people and all of those led to all of my jobs like throughout the last six or seven years so i do think that networking and maintaining like good relations uh with people can take you a very long way and in this context i think one tip that i got that i keep giving everyone as well uh is always have an answer to the question what do you want to do or what do you do because if somebody is taking a moment of their time to ask you what you want to do and you are in that setting where maybe they can help you don't don't say oh i'm not sure yet i'm still exploring this have a solid answer as to what your immediate plans are and maybe that person might have an option for you and that's exactly what happened with me my first job out of nyu i had met the former canadian ambassador to india and he asked me he was talking to the nyu law grads on opportunities in international law and he uh, you know we so i asked him a few questions we struck a good rapport he invited me to lunch he asked me to bring my cv and uh, we kind of started to talk it was he asked me what i'm interested in doing and obviously at that by that point i had a really good image of what i wanted to do whether it's advising states on international disputes whether it's uh, you know putting my knowledge of advanced negotiation to practice whether it's to advise the foreign ministry on policy decisions uh, whether it's advising the foreign ministry on obligations under international covenants whether it's negotiating international covenants i had so many sort of um, goals that i had articulated to him and he was just like you know i know the perfect person who can help you now this i think i would not tell people to bank on this type of an opportunity but the lesson here is that you can you can always help yourself by being really really prepared so you can't dictate what opportunities come your way but you absolutely can dictate how much you make of the opportunities that come your way so i would definitely like encourage people to have an answer to what it is they want to do or what it is uh, they are currently doing um the other thing in terms of failure is uh, similar to what mohit said um because you know international law is a kind of field where i think a lot of people um can a lot of people have spoken about how they do unpaid work in the beginning but also a little bit later on into their career as well 
um i was in a situation where i had i had an offer for a job that i really really wanted and i had been envisioning this for a long time but they did not have funding for that role so um i reached out to a couple of people whom i thought uh, might help because they've either worked in that position previously or they know other people who are in that field and um they actually ended up one thing led to another and somebody put me in touch with the wife of a judge who ran a trust to fund young international lawyers specifically for that job and i just could not believe like how um how accurate that sort of connection was so i think my takeaway from that is always have an open mind and um just because you see somewhere that an op- a role is not funded it doesn't mean that there's absolutely no way for you to get funding you can maybe consider a fellowship or you can reach out to your mentors or professors maybe they will know somebody who can put you in touch with someone in that field who in like in my case knew someone who was operating a trust which was not well advertised uh specifically to fund lawyers doing that kind of work so um that's definitely one thing and i think this is also tied to the point where uh where the panelists said that you sometimes don't even know what opportunities are out there i think this is the lesson that i keep learning every year because every time i'm looking to every year or every year and a half whenever i'm trying to look for what my next role would be um i have no idea that that kind of work even exists and then i end up meeting somebody and then you know they tell me about it so i think since the pandemic started i have written i don't know i've had about 100 informational calls i think like it's not an exaggeration and i've obviously written to at least three or four times that many people so and again i would say that's a pretty good success rate so i think having a really good cover email is also important but that's not the takeaway here the takeaway here is when the pandemic hit i was actually in the transition and i was not sure what i was going to do and obviously there were people saying this is not a great time for you to be switching jobs but it yeah but on the other hand it is a great time to explore what what else is out there so i ended up coming back to bangalore i gave up my position in new york and i came back for personal reasons and i ended up joining a law firm and i now lead their public international law practice arna law but i'm again i'm leaving soon but this has been an incredible 9 months um so every single job so i worked with the government i worked with the inter- i worked with uh, the irmct which is an international criminal court in tanzania that prosecutes um, high level government officials for their uh, involvement in the rwandan genocide and uh, i've consulted with think tanks i've worked with international law firms and now i'm back home in bangalore and i think every single job has uh, sort of taught me to sharp, like i've learned to sharpen my vision a little more of what it is i exactly want so i would say to close not to really take any opportunity and take any failure as a failure in itself but just take it as an opportunity to refine your vision a little more so yeah that's my conclusion thank you so much anusha thanks for for sharing Uh, your experiences i also have a weird story with relation to the un i was applying for internships internships not even jobs so i applied for one and uh two years later they invited me for an interview <laughs> i'm like um do you expect me to just wait for two years for your answer but yeah the situation might have been different maybe i i would have done it but it's just ridiculous what they imply right when they are reviewing uh, the applications and thank you so much for touching upon the uh, mentorship uh, uh, theme so i guess maybe it will be a uh, kicking off uh, like points when we will move to success of like you know what helped us to uh, to be where we are now but uh, shubhangi has a uh, has a raised hand do you want to add yeah, something I- I just want to add something to what Anusha was saying before I forget. So I really like the fact that she's 
uh, spoke about the importance of being prepared. And I think it's important, of course, uh, to be prepared not only in terms of what you want to do and what you want to achieve, but also how much salary you expect and like what you're expecting in return. And I thought this is particularly hard for me and I've learned it through like really bad experiences um, where I was like just given an offer uh, to be an international law advisor to a permanent mission of a state. I'm not at liberty to name the state, but this was a state which had money. It wasn't a developing country. And um, for some reason, the offer was really, really low and it wouldn't have even covered my living expenses there which is pretty like crazy when you think about it because this is a state which can easily fund and I, it wasn't even like I was uh, with a bunch of other people I was the only international legal advisor so um, this was definitely an opportunity that should have been properly and fairly compensated for but uh, wasn't initially at least so I think even when you're uh, what I did wrong was that when I wasn't prepared I didn't have like a ballpark figure in mind of what I would expect from the role, um, which I think led, which I think allowed the other person to dominate the conversation uh, when it came to the salary negotiation. And I think that is something that you just have to be prepared for, especially because a lot of these opportunities are also contractual in international law. We're not necessarily, um, you don't necessarily have like an institutional stipend that's being paid, but like you're interacting with a particular person who might have like certain resources that they can give you. Um, so I think yeah, I just wanted to add that. Thank you so much. It's uh, I think it's very important. Um, but now let's uh, let's move to our success stories. And why don't we start from Ankit this time? Well, it's very difficult to classify what success really is because I mean it's not actually that you reach there because once you reach there you realize how 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 tall the mountain actually is and where you've reached is just a sort of a tiny plateau uh, that's just been that's just been how how at least I've looked at success everything has actually been a stepping stone for something much bigger and something which you don't even uh, uh, expect or at least can foresee um, at least that's what one can say of how uh, how how opportunities have worked for me and how everything has come together at least for this summer so next well just tomorrow i'll be in heidelberg uh with you julia uh for this uh, summer seminar on uh, uh foreign relations law uh, conflict of laws and populism now i'll be the only student who's not even an llm there everyone's going to be a postdoctoral or doctoral student uh, but the institute's been kind enough to give an opportunity to someone who's, well, I wouldn't say is Global South and, you know, is, is junior. It's just perhaps they want a different perspective on something which everybody is involved in. And I think that's been the aim and motivation to do something like this, which is affecting everyone's life. And similarly, even with even with the paper that I'll present in, in uh, Lisbon at the ILA conference, uh, which is also again on scholarship is that uh, it's it's to have a different voice and have a different perspective on issues and that's always been this trajectory to of mine to explore whatever I'm studying whatever I'm reading from a different light from a different perspective because what is already there is already there and if you can't add upon it or build upon it then there's not much point of your of your participation in that initiative as such um, and, and and I'm just trying to share what 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 is already what is something which I can already foresee which is happening and classify classify it as as success. Um, and after that, I have supposed to do the uh, uh, the final reading for the ILC and work under the the chair for the session, uh, Professor Park. Um, and I have to sandwich uh, the Hague Academy in between of that. And even for the Hague Academy, I have to uh, go for the directed studies program, which is again reserved for um, postdoctoral students, doctoral students, and also early career professionals. So, I mean, essentially, I'm going to be uh, just thrown into the, the, the deep side of the pit and explore these areas. But again, I would not consider this as opportunity as, 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 you know, uh, uh, opportunities which have come as a challenge but as a success to be classified and to be put in the same box as someone who's so much more uh, uh, adroit than I am and, um, and one has to be deeply conscious of that fact as well but that also also is the motivating fact to read and prepare yourself to at least 
to at least be able to have some sort of say or perspective on what is going to be done so success hasn't really but one really doesn't know what success means at least i have never looked at anything as as success is just something as a recognition of the efforts that one has put in and to move on with it and try and look and try and improve this might sound cliche but try and look at international law as improving the lives of those unfortunate persons uh, and this spans everywhere and across everyone and i think not only practice but even theory helps in in these conceptual frameworks thank you so much ankit and um just to remind everyone if you are the smartest in the room you're in the wrong room I think we should all keep this in mind. And um, I think that's what Ankit was trying to tell us because that's what moves you forward. If you are surrounded by people who are um, maybe a step, a step ahead of you, but like in different terms, right? It doesn't mean that they're more successful. It just probably means that they're uh, more experienced and they can give you advice, uh, etc. So in the meantime, I asked uh, the audience to maybe type their questions in the Q&A box. And um, I guess we will move to maybe again back to Anusha. Maybe you want to tell us uh, how you got to NYU, for instance, or whatever you prefer to, to talk about. But um, since we're talking about success, uh, not defined success, but uh, for some people who might want to uh, follow the similar or maybe even the same career path, maybe it's um, useful to hear how you how you got to at NYU and then what you did further, although we heard that uh, partly how you did it, but maybe you want to go into detail. Yeah, I think um, what I'll do is I will just focus a little bit on um, applying to NYU if that's something that the audience is interested in. But I want to really zero in on the things that I did to get like two jobs that I think really shaped my career. So the first thing in relation to NYU, I think I um, did my master's right out of undergrad. So I did not have work experience. And uh, that is a challenge. However, there are some, there were a handful of us at NYU. It was not obviously just me who had graduated law school. So one thing that uh, you can use to demonstrate your interest in the field is um, research and writing. So I would really encourage people who are very keen to do their master's right, up, right after undergrad to have a strong sort of uh, focus on academia. Like if you can uh, show that you've been relatively well published, um, you know, or if um, if you have been a teaching assistant to your international law professors, these were the things that I could do while I was a law student. Apart from that, I did do internships, which I think all law students do. And there was a time in my career where I didn't know I wanted to do international law. After third year of law school, I was exploring all of my opportunities. So it was after that, I think for me, it was really uh, Jessup. Having done Jessup, that was for me the solidifying experience. Uh, that sort of told me I wanted to do uh, international law. And by that time, I had developed a strong, -ish, like kind of a strong grasp, I would say, on uh, drafting and research in international law. And that was able to come through in my application. I had also done summer school um, in uh, Amsterdam. And if that is something that is an option for people, I would also recommend that. But I understand that also comes at a cost. And uh, I think I did apply for scholarships, but this is a little bit too much in the past. So I'll have to look back at my CV to, to confirm if I what kind of scholarships I applied for. But yeah, definitely research and writing is one thing that you can use to uh, stand out. Uh, after NYU, um, I think the thing that helped me the most is that one networking session where I met this individual who was the Canadian ambassador to India, who put me in touch with the then... Um, ambassador of India to the UN. And I think Mohit, I'm, we may have met briefly at that session as well. So yeah, I mean, I think an international order circle is not that big. So definitely like make friends, be nice to people, stay in touch, you know, because you are going to potentially meet them and work with them. So I think building good relations is really important. So through my work there, I actually was able to build a genuine rapport with not just the diplomats, but also diplomats from other missions. Um, and uh, once my role at the Indian mission ended, it was, I think, for one year. 
I uh, was I was at the time doing a consultancy with the World Bank, and a, my colleague and friend from another mission wrote out, wrote back to me saying they're looking to expand their legal team, and they actually had a couple of disputes at the ICJ at the time, so they needed advice on that. So for me, it was just like the universe bringing me this perfectly wrapped gift, you know, and all of that is because. Now, I didn't know any of this was going to happen. I only was putting in my best every day at my work, becoming friends with people, doing my work. And I didn't know what what would lead to what. But then in the future, they wrote back to me saying, hey, if you're interested, you know, uh, we can walk you through the application process. And I still had to go through that process. But the fact is that the opportunity was there because through my previous job, I was people were able to see my competence. They were able to see how I speak. They were able to see that I was committed to my work. And I had very, I had like glowing recommendations. So all of that is something that's in your control. Whereas what comes next is not always in your control. So definitely, I think that's one lesson. The success there is to make the most of the opportunity that you have now, because that might lead you to your next big opportunity. But really treat every opportunity as, as, as if it is a really big one and give it your all. So that's definitely one thing I would say. The, and I'm going to wrap up with the second example, which is uh, me successfully getting, uh, getting a job with the UN IRMCT in Tanzania, which was a court that was set up by the Security Council to, as I said, prosecute people responsible for the Rwandan genocide. Uh, that was also my first experience uh, working in international criminal law, and it opened up a whole new door of opportunities that I didn't even know I was interested in. And uh, that's actually when I realized that I didn't want to only be an advisor for one government, and I wanted to actually represent multiple clients before international courts. And that's why I actually decided to move uh, to a firm, to move from that advisory role that I had for so long to more of a representative role. And uh, I would say for the UN to stand out, really um, learn how to distill all of your experience into three or four paragraphs that really speaks to the job description and uh, have maybe um, really go through the, prof the competencies and the requirements in the UN job and try to match your application to that. Because I did not know anybody in the hiring team. And from what my supervisor told me then, they actually picked my application out uh, just based on my cover letter. Although it helps to know somebody in any job, if you apply and you can tell somebody, hey, I'm interested in this role, I've applied, it helps. But it's. I think my story is an example that it doesn't always have to be that way. Um, I think my experience with uh, being a government advisor, I was able to leverage that here as well. I, I distilled the diplomatic experience that I had, the legal experience that I had, my experience working on sensitive political matters, perhaps things that maybe other candidates didn't think would be relevant to their job. But I spent a lot of time trying to analyze how my experience was unique and why I should be the one to get that role. I know it sounds a bit cliche, but I think uh, well, and I know for a fact because my supervisor told me that that is what stood out in my application. So um, definitely don't give up hope and uh, be very clear in your cover letter because people are reading every word of it. They receive 2000 applications and they read every single word of every single application. Maybe not every office in the UN, but that office did. So um, definitely, uh, you know, take that very seriously. And also, once you get there, uh, really know that it's a small community of people who have uprooted their lives and moved to Tanzania for the larger cause of international criminal law. So you will likely meet them in the future. Like I now know colleagues who have moved on to the ICC, who are working on their own, who are now hiring for other teams. Like they've recently captured a new fugitive and they're growing their team for putting that fugitive on trial. So I have my uh, juniors from university who are interested in the field and I often tell them to check their page to see if they're offering internships because I know that team is hiring. So um, yeah, my other kind of, I guess, thing, something that I did that worked, which I would like to call success is, uh, I think being uh, sort of your authentic self and I guess treating people nicely uh, and being in touch with them and just, you know, building your connections over time because I think that's how the network develops. You may not meet somebody tomorrow and they offer you a job right away, but networks tend to pay off in a few years. 
And I am seeing that happening now. And I actually got through one of my mentees actually got an internship at a place of her choice where I previously interned through my reference. So it really works out the way that, you know, our mentors told us and now we're telling our mentees. So yeah, those are my few. Thank you so much, Anusha, for this generous uh, contribution. Ankit, you have a raised hand. i just make one very short comment. There's this historian by the name of Neil Ferguson, who's actually done a sociological historical study of networks and how these actually work. He uses Henry Kissinger and places him in a bubble and how these networks of Kissinger exploded during the Second World War and the Cold War, which is a fascinating study. Uh, the point of sharing this is because you must read widely. Uh, the second point being that he also says something quite interesting. For the professors, you must read what the professor has said and must introduce yourself after your name by saying, I've read your work. That is because at the end of the day, they're also individuals and recognition of any sort of any individual makes them feel more valuable to, 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 to themselves and also at a greater appreciation of the work which they're trying to do. and. And there's, there's no paucity of doing this. I mean, you can pick up books, you can look at lectures, you can look at uh, workshops, and you can interact with these persons. It's not difficult reaching out to them. I mean, we, all of us have done it. And uh, all it takes is to have a bit of courage and a bit of confidence to do something like that. And that's how from a network, a circle, a circle, a circle is created. And from these circles, there are these different rungs of circles then which get created depending on how a relationship you share with someone. And I mean, one doesn't even have to look far to, to see these. I mean, I remember watching Philippe Sands speak about uh, Judge Crawford. And it was a fascinating address of how Sands spoke of how Crawford inspired him. Just yesterday we heard, at least for the society, we heard a, a memorial lecture for Judge Trinidade. And we focused essentially on Brazilian and Latin American scholars. And I'm thankful to Mohit for helping me with that, uh, because without his help, that would have happened. But what I'm essentially trying to say is that work can be quite inspiring, but you need to connect at it with a humane level as well, because that is the essential ingredient for a long-lasting relationship. And finances can also work out, because if the institution which the person represents is willing and is also capable, then financial, inst then financial requirements can also be taken care of. And I say that in respect to the questions which have come in, in the chat box. Thanks, Ankit. Anusha, you wanna? Yeah, sorry, I just wanted on? to add one more quick sentence there, which is, I mean, at the end of all of this, even coming away with just a group of really good friends with whom you share a passion for international law is a huge gift in itself. You don't really have to look at it from the point of view of extracting something out of them. And that's actually how networking works. You genuinely uh, share a vibe with some people and then it's okay if you don't share that with everyone. The point is to be authentic to your interests and to how you project yourself and the right opportunities and people um, you know, who resonate with that will come into your circle. So there's no point pretending if that's really not what you're interested in or if that's not who you are. That's just what I wanted to add. I don't think we are looking at networking as purely opportuni opportunistic, but also just uh, the reward is phenomenal, even if you just end up with a group of really close friends. Great. Now I will pass to Mohit, but I ask you to keep it short because unfortunately we have only 10 minutes left. I know that's un very unfair, but maybe you can like thesisly um, share with us your experiences. Thank you very much. And in fact, before I do that, if, if everyone else agrees, I think we should also ask Julia for, for her experiences. And before I take the floor and knowing that 10 minutes are left, uh, perhaps you can speak to us about your failures and successes because I think you are as much or more qualified to, to speak about those uh, in this session. So, <laughs> this is very kind, Mohit. I, I wasn't prepared to speak, but again, due to time concerns, I will just you know mention that the most important was that 
when I graduated from law school, I couldn't find any job. But I was so committed to international law that that's why I was not a, I was not sacrificing, you know, to go into the private sector or whatever. So I was looking, looking and looking and it lasted for years. Uh, so again, this failure pushed me to maybe find a uh, look for a job abroad and that was that was what happened i don't know if it was for better or for worse but now i'm here uh, so yeah it might you know when you are dreaming about working abroad it might bring you to somewhere else but i was hoping to work in my home country and it didn't bring me anywhere but brought me here so it's i think my point is just to be open about it and uh, you know your failures because i thought of myself as a failure right when i couldn't find a job but now i'm in a relatively decent and i can even say good position so your failures can turn into your success at some point so uh, I wish I could speak more, but I guess we really want to hear from Mahita and Shubhangi and then maybe to take a few questions. But I'm always open for um, a discussion via email or via call, so don't hesitate to reach out. But I really appreciate it, Mohit. It's very kind of you. But now, back to you. Thank you very much for sharing that. And I think a lot has been said substantively by, by Ankit and by Anusha and, and I'm so grateful to them that I'm coming after them for speaking about this. So I will try to touch upon a different element. Uh, that is the mental state uh, that I have, that I have tried to uh, inculcate over the period of a certain few years and, and, and how then it helps me uh, see through success in, in this instant, but also failure. So. First, what I would say, and this is not just true for public international law, what I'll say is that success for me is contentment with what I am doing every single day. I know that we discuss about uh, the process of getting to point X in, in our careers. So while we are in the process, we should look at every single step as a success story in itself. That's what I try to tell myself, and that's what motivates me every single day in this field which we have spoken about that can have many, many paths. So that is one. The second is that the moment anybody tries to put me in a box in public international law, I throw a different angle to, to people, and that is purposeful. So I'm also trying to, being conscious of the time, I'm also trying to connect it with some of the questions here as to what do you want to do when you don't know what you want to do? I know that I'd like to practice public international law with as many lenses as is possible. And so you can, on the one hand, say that perhaps this guy doesn't know what he wants to do. But in that cloak, I actually want to do everything that exists there. So and my biggest success story from this is that if I walk into any given room, whether it's a room full of policymakers, of academics, of litigators, of people who are negotiators, of treaty texts, I can speak in, uh, speak in any of those rooms uh, and relate it to the experiences that I've been able to have till now. That is my biggest success. Now, someone else can see it as as a failure because i have not had uh, a continued stint at one given place which would have helped me climb the ladder so another success story for me here is to really shut the noise i i don't see what my friends are doing whether in law firms or particularly domestically the with the number of years that I have now, my friends and peers are principal associates about to be partners in law firms. And I will be joining a law firm as a junior lawyer right now. Juris Junior is the position name, which is one level short of an associate and one level above a trainee. But 
having said that, if I'd worked in a law firm from the very outset, perhaps you wouldn't have even called me to speak today. So, so that is my success story, to be able to have the honor to, to, to speak to all of you today. And, and success also is, again, touching upon the question, to be able to try and have just enough finances, especially early on in my career, to, to support me on a monthly basis. Uh, it's not asking for more early on in my career and focusing more on what I, what I gain as, as experience. And I try to not reiterate, but I cannot help myself but to echo what Anusha said and uh, one aspect specifically. For me, success genuinely is not networking. I don't even go with that mindset to meet any single person. And I meet people who are senior to me in the profession as well as junior to me with the same outlook that I strike a conversation and I learn from everybody. I just learned from Ankit about uh, what he said about Winston Churchill, for example, because I, for one, I have a very linear uh, approach. Uh, even for leisure, I sit and read international law. I don't read anything else. So... Um, which I don't recommend to anyone. Uh, but so, so for me, success is even just reading uh, a chapter of one of my favorite books of, of international law. And that has helped me in unimaginable situations because I was in a conversation with person X and something that I'd read three years ago or a conversation that I had two or three years ago with someone else led me into a conversation with someone else and at one point of time got me a job. So, so success for me, finally, just to end, is a very intangible notion. Once I think we all, and including the people who raised questions here, can, can try to do this, I know it, it's hard, then, then our journeys in public international law are already a success story. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohit. And um, just to add, networking is important, obviously, but what is, uh, what is more important is just to be a good human being, and this will just pay off. Um, and on this note, I'm, uh, Shubani, do you want to add something? I love how wholesome the conversation has gotten. Uh, at the outset, I do not read international law for leisure. I would read anything but international law for leisure, in fact. Um, I think I have a very um, strange equation with both failure and success. I think uh, it's something that I'm trying to develop a better relationship with. But I remember that poem, um, which is basically like treat both failure and success as imposters. I'm definitely paraphrasing it. Um, but I think that is something that has been a hard, um, but I think much needed learning for me. Um, where I think just re like resonating with what you said, Yulia, that um, if failures, if given a long enough timeline can also become successes. So something that I was really struggling with was that um, I actually got like a dream job offer um, right before the pandemic struck. So that job offer fell through. Um, and I was really confused. I think it also mirrors a question that was asked about what international law can you practice if you have limited finances and if you want to stay in your home country. Uh, unfortunately, I think as with most other countries in the global south, there just isn't enough um, legal capacity in international law, which means that the opportunities are very limited. There are certain law firms that you can join. I did join one of them. Um, and depending on uh, whether you're lucky or not, you do get some good work where you're representing the government. You get to work on very interesting international law matters. For instance, uh, on our WTO matter, we are working on Article 48 of the Vienna Convention, which is very interesting because it deals with error. And I think there's just one other case law on error. So um, that is one option. But the other option is, of course, working with the government, which again is very um, interesting because um, the Indian government will hardly pay you money to sustain yourself if you uh, want to get into a career, uh, like just practice international law. Uh, that being said, I think what honestly, again, is something I'm again trying to learn is that uh, I think it's really easy, at least in the beginning of your career, to get really swept up by what other people are doing, what you think you should be doing, and like glory hunting, basically. So whether it's, um, you know, like trying to publish more than you read, or trying to do like the best work, um, or the most glamorous work there is. And I honestly think that, uh, at least in this 
like field playing the long game really works. Uh, so even if you're doing things that don't sound super glamorous, say for a couple of years when you're just starting out, uh, but you're learning certain hard and soft skills that will help you later on in the future, I think that's a better position to be in than uh, I don't know to have like some a very fancy LinkedIn update. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Rupani, for keeping it short, but so dense and so informative. Uh, I want to ask our panelists first if we have time to take some questions. And if everyone is fine with it, maybe we can take a few. Um, but it's, it's up to you, because I know that we are going beyond the time. Well, we can, uh, time-wise, they're fine, at least from the IT end. But of course, this is subject to, sub, uh, well, everyone else here. fine by me thank you if it's fine then maybe yeah just uh, just a few questions and i will try to combine them i guess the um the one question was asked at least wisely and what is the most lucrative job uh in in the field of international law and maybe we can also combine it um with the question of what uh, opportunities there are in india maybe some of you can uh, take this two questions uh, simultaneously. I don't know who wants to start because I'm certainly not qualified to answer. <laughs> Anusha, maybe you want to start. Yeah, sure. Although I should uh, preface this by saying that this is my first job in India, but it has been uh, a really eye-opening one. So I work um, now, my experience working in India has been with the international disputes team of Arna Law, and we also have a, a, a growing public international law practice and a very well-established investor state disputes practice. So um, in relation to the question as to what is the most lucrative field in international law, I this is really from my experience. I, I don't know if there's exactly just one answer to this, um, but I suppose working with international law firms that do investor state arbitration or commercial arbitration might be the textbook answer for what is lucrative. But I don't know if in that setting you'll get to do a lot of core public international law because I know a lot of firms do commercial arbitration, but uh, not a lot of ISDS work. And if you consider ISDS as enough public international law work, then I suppose that's for you. But uh, I wanted to do a lot of public international law work that didn't, um, where I wasn't constrained to only doing investor state disputes. I wanted to do, I wanted to, you know, I wanted there to be aspects of customary international law outside of the BIT context. I wanted there to be state responsibility. I wanted there to be analysis of the VCDR and all of that. So, um, business and human rights as well, which is another kind of up and coming field. Uh, so I think to answer that question, you really have to find a balance between what kind of work do you really want to do and how much money do you consider as lucrative. So if you have that answer for yourself, then I think you can shortlist a few firms. There are also some governments that pay well. I would not say the Indian government is fully on that list, but there are some other governments that pay well. Uh, some of them, perhaps you may want to consider governments in the Middle East. Maybe, I don't know if there are people who are eligible for jobs with the US government. Um, that would, of, of course, depend on your citizenship and residency and all of that. I have met people who, for whom those are not um, restrictions. So you may want to think of, it's not just when you think of lucrative, you'll really have to answer like, what kind of work do you want to do for the money that you're getting? So that's really the premise of the question. Um, sorry, what was the other question again? Uh, the other question was the Indian, um, the Indian opportunities in India. Yeah. Like so very quickly, I think that um, one of the ways that you can do international law in India is through, and if you're okay, if you're interested in research, is to work with policy think tanks. There are some in Delhi, there are one or two in Bangalore. For example, in Bangalore, there is an NGO called the Center for Internet and Society. Um, they have an inter a public international law and cyber norms division, specifically funded by the MacArthur Grant. They do a lot of important research and they publish a lot in the field of PIL and tech. Um, and then um, I think, but that's, oh, and if you're interested in teaching as well, I teach at NLSIU, that's one way of 
practicing international law, I suppose, you get to, uh, like, for example, in my class, I simulate a lot of UN negotiations. So, uh, and you get to meet a lot of other students who are also very passionate about the field who want to do great things. And it's a really nice environment to kind of learn and also give back and to just hear like different backstories. So that's another thing you can consider. And I think one last thing I would say is, it's not, a, there's not a lot of opportunity, but it is there. And that is in uh, constitutional law litigation. A lot of people who do civil rights litigation do interpret uh, international human rights covenants. So if that's something you're interested in, then you should consider that. Shubhangi, do you want to add something? Yes, I just want to implore everyone to follow my blog because we uh, publish monthly paid opportunities in the field of international law. And this can range from, um, like uh, Anusha mentioned, law firms, government work, but also uh, like human rights organizations like the Migration and Asylum Project. Um, so there are a lot of like domestic stakeholders that are doing good work. It's just really hard to find them. Maybe you can post the link uh, in the chat so everybody has access to it. I will do that. And I guess maybe we can move to some more other questions and um, one of that follows from what we were talking about, like how to find a lucrative job first, uh, understand what you want to do. But for some people, it's not really uh, easy to understand what they want to do. And even if they do, then there might be uh, problems with the feeling of fulfillment, like um, uh, what if I'm doing boring tasks, but it's related somehow to what I like generally want to do, but um, how to how to deal with it when you are uh, when you are tasked with something which you don't particularly like. And uh, maybe we can also combine it with the question. It's what was Anusha was telling, always have an answer to the question what you want to do and what to do if you don't have an answer to this question. Shubhangi, do you want to take it or it's your race hand from the previous? No, that's uh, from the previous one. I'm not going to try to answer one. this question. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was saying I won't even uh, try to answer yes. this question. <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't know who wants to take it. Maybe Mohit or Anusha. Sure. Maybe Mohit can take the other question. Since I mentioned the have an answer, I'm happy to answer that part. But of course, like, please, Mohit, feel free to answer both. Sure. So uh, you said uh, the aspect of fulfillment, the aspect of what if you have the lucrative job and you find it boring, if I understood it correct. Right. So uh, I think I have already uh, answered the question on fulfillment, which is that, as I said, success for me is, 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 is contentment in, in what I'm doing on, on a daily basis. Now, having a lucrative job can, I, I confess, can lead to uh, you um, doing boring tasks. But the answer to that is, is, is very simple. I, I think our target audience today is, is young professionals. So I actually ask a question back that do we need those lucrative jobs right now? Can we wait for a few years uh, to, to get them or not? If we can, then we have a solution. And I think I live by this world every single day of my life. I have, I have not taken up many lucrative positions over even unpaid positions. And yes, I said, I do save for my rainy days. Uh, so I do understand where the question might be coming from. That is uh, having to support themselves, not having uh, support from family, so on and so forth. But if we really try to define what they mean by lucrative, then a lot of opportunities can open up for them, such as pursuing a PhD and being a research assistant at the same time. I think Julia can, can speak more about, about such positions. Um, that can allow someone to have uh, in their early careers jobs that can, that can support them on a monthly basis, and then they do what they like to do. But even in a conventional setting, what, what Anusha also touched upon, if we are, because I just finished working at a law firm, which does investment arbitration and public international law advisory. 
there are places out there where you can do work in the subject matter that you like to work in and at the same time uh, get the lucrative salary, so to speak. Now, those positions are limited. So even if I take out public international advisory, if I simply stick to arbitration, then I think what public international law enthusiasts can be mindful of is to see how much of investment arbitration at least uh, a particular law firm is doing. And if that is more, then I can vouch for it that you will not find your job to be boring. There are so many notions pertaining to state responsibility, uh, pertaining to the interpretation of the Vienna Convention, uh, pertaining to uh, counterclaims in the human rights context, in the environmental context that can come in uh, when, when, when you're doing uh, investment arbitration. I, I remember uh, that very recently I had to analyze the ILC's work on subsequent agreements and subsequent practice in the context of an investment arbitration, which for me was very fulfilling because I had worked at the ILC before in time and, and how, uh, how all your experiences are amalgamated is something that, that you can experience only when you get to a different setting. And just lastly, I would say that one can also work in one lucrative setting, have a financial cushion, and then move. So you are still learning very much from, from that setting. You may feel that the subject matter is boring, but the soft skills that you're learning, the drafting skills that you learn, the communication skills that you learn in a private setup are, uh, are I would say, very, very precious in every setting going forward. So if, if someone can also change their perspective into uh, having a boring subject matter, but learning other soft skills and organizational skills, those also take us uh, really far, especially uh, at the young stages of our career. Thanks, Mohit. So, Anusha, very briefly, what to answer when someone is asking you what you want to do? Yeah, so uh, I think the question was, how do you answer that if you don't know what you want to do? And so I also had this question once, and I think the, the point of saying be prepared is, you just have to be prepared to relative to where you are. You don't have to be in fourth year of law school and have your five years planned out. Even if you know what subjects you're interested in and what kind of research you want to do, for example, that's enough for you to craft a good response. In fact, somebody went far enough, far, as far as telling me that your answer doesn't even have to be true. It doesn't even have to be remotely true. You know, it just has to connect a little bit with the person that you're speaking to. Let's say you go to an event and you meet uh, somebody who is a professor at an institute where you want to apply for an LLM. You just need to be able to strike that conversation up where you say, hey, I'm interested in, I don't know, international humanitarian law. And I know that you're sort of chair of this, this, this practice. Um, what advice do you have? Or this is the kind of, this is, uh, I want to apply for my LLM next year. What advice do you have? So you just need to be, in, you need to have enough clarity to sort of connect what they're doing to what you want to be doing. And it doesn't have to be very specific. It can at least, it can just be in the, uh, if you can identify the area of the law that you're interested in and maybe one or two steps that you can take. So just the point is don't meet somebody that you're, you look up to and not have anything to say, right? That's what we're trying to avoid. So, and it doesn't, that also doesn't mean the other side of the spectrum where you have your entire plan laid out. So yeah, my response would be to just be, to have some minimum level of clarity where you can combine what the other person is doing with what you would like to do. Thank you so much. I think the time is up. So unfortunately we cannot take some questions, but I hope there will be other uh, opportunities when we can discuss uh, the rest that we couldn't. And I'm very grateful for all the panelists. I learned enormously. So thank you so much for sharing all your experiences with us or your advice and hints. I think it was really, really helpful. And uh, you are definitely the people to look, look up to. And I hope that... Uh, yeah, this event was helpful for more junior 
people in this uh, in the audience. So, but I hope that we will uh, continue the discussion at some point. Thank you so much. I guess we can close, right, Ankita, unless you want to say the final word. Well, uh, let me just take this opportunity to thank everyone as well, uh, along with Yulia, for, for taking our time to do this. Uh, Shubangi, you might as well enter your contact, uh, the blog details, because there are people asking for that. And if anyone else wants to get in touch with the members of this panel or with the society, you are more than welcome to reach out to us on our uh, social media platforms or otherwise as well. Um, I think perhaps I speak for everyone when I say that we'd be more than happy to give advice and counsel uh, to others and perhaps also because we didn't have this advice or counsel to, so to give back in this sense to those who, who can learn from it is, is something which was the core idea behind organizing something like this as well. Um, and. Um, uh, let me just also just very quickly say that it's very important to find a mentor, um, not just one, but many, but have an organic relationship with them as well. Uh, not just seek counsel when counsel is required, but also develop a d deeper relationship with them and connect with them at different levels. And then as, uh, uh, as Shivangi said, read other things as well and discuss other things with them as well. And then you'll develop a deeper understanding of who they are as well. And uh, I'll just very briefly say that this is something I saw in uh, when when Sands, uh, Philippe Sands spoke about James Crawford as well and the, the the relationship that both of them shared and the India Myanmar case which was taking place the the it laws and the ICG and there were two rows which were appointed by India and uh, Crawford wrote back to Sands saying that there are two rows in one dispute so I think these are just small anecdotes which you develop if you have a relationship with someone and this teaches you quite a lot not only about how the person thinks but what he believes in and uh, this organic relationship can take you places which you can't even imagine uh, thank you everyone once again uh, let us not take further time uh, Yulia thank you so much for doing this uh, and and it's been quite quite a riveting journey thank you very much thank you thank you so much <laughs>